Ah, the Terrible Luck movie. Remember this old project? I remember this project vaguely. I remember seeing it advertised when I was briefly in LA, like a couple years back. That was all I ever saw, just one giant billboard on the side of a skyscraper and nary a trailer to really tell us what's going on. And since this was back in 2022, I just kind of skipped it, never got around to it, you know? This movie really only has one factoid attached to it that you may know. It's a John Lasseter thing. After being ousted from his own industry and away from the studio he founded, he went off to make his own project in its own little way, and we all just kind of side-eye it from the corner of the room, you know? Now this movie was made with Sky Dance Animation, which was a very first since it was only just founded back in 2017, or do you know, by John Lasseter. Although he's actually only the head of animation, the actual president is apparently Holly Edwards. Anyway, you know, it's John Lasseter making his own project the quintessential spin-off of a Pixar movie, and I'll be honest, I have not heard good things. So, let's get into this. Okay, this intro is literally just some soundtrack music from Sonic Advance 2, it's practically identical. So of course, this movie is gonna be all about luck, which is actually a bit of an interesting concept. In fact, actually, one of my favorite animation shorts I've ever seen is all about luck. I've covered it previously on the channel and everything. So seeing it done in a full theatrical release and with a key person involved, how bad can it be? Well, suddenly it's a music video. What is happening? With there are animal people, things are just kind of thrown at your face. This is incredibly high on the retention time. And then we immediately cut to a couple of influencers. Ah, uh, it's one of those, huh? Doing the classic thing of immediately not trusting its audience to hold their own attention by just gripping you as hard as it can immediately. And of course, going with the trendy cool thing the kids do on the side. You sure have bad luck, Sam Greenfield. Can you be any more on the nose? And so then the movie goes on to showcase some lucky items. You know, if we're playing with luck, every single idea that's attached to luck is of course gonna make an appearance. Fine, fair enough. To be honest, this whole movie kind of just looks like one big mobile ad. Does that make sense to anyone else? Like, it just seems like the budget visuals of a mobile ad plugged into a theatrical release. I feel like give it a few more seconds and you're gonna see the tag to say divorce or pregnant. Anyway, they then go on to mention the old pick up a penny, it gives you good luck rhyme as we come along to learn a little bit of context for our plotline. A social worker's waiting for you. Yeah, shouldn't have hit those kids, Sam. But no, it turns out she is aging out because she's at an orphanage, forced away at the age of 18, never having the luck to ever be adopted by parents. And she's not sure she's really ready to move out yet. And following that, we then get a flashback to her very first visit at the orphanage at the Coleman house, whereby the mum's on the phone all the time and it's all just one big sad montage. You gotta really feel for your main protagonist. Life just gets her down. What a lovely cheery topic for a kid's movie. Though to be fair, it's not the first time. Meet the Robinsons had a similar start. We're gonna need some time to think about it. And so off Sam goes out to the real world for the very first time. She's had all sorts of homes in the past and none of them ever picked her up. So now she gets her own home all by herself. It's a bittersweet ending that ends up as our beginning. As keys fall into the drain, she has a spare anyway and the agency won't call for another month. She's officially, officially sad and on her own. Fast forward to the bit you're actually waiting for in a movie like this, the big old montage of bad luck. This is the kind of stuff you expect to see out of an animated movie, just the world going chaotic. A little bit of over the top fantastical fun to show some bad luck in a character. It's what all the shorts obviously focus on with their very small runtime, and really kids just crave final destination that they're allowed to consume and doesn't involve decapitation, let's be honest. And all sorts of things happen, leaves are blown into the window, the bed shuts itself, they're late for the alarm, they're locked in the bathroom, the door handle comes out, the toaster doesn't work, the paper towel exists, the toast hits the wall, the socks don't match. Yeah, sure, that's really some incredible bad luck there, sure. This really is the highlight of the whole movie. It's probably the thing that was in the trailer the most. It makes sense, right? And honestly, it's nice to see. With the field of animation, you can do all sorts of incredible things, though the camera's not very crazy. It's quite standard, really. The vaguely creative ways they manage to make everything go wrong is nice. It's good jokes. It does a good bit. But does it get old? Because... We've got two hours of this coming up. We'll see, but for now, I will praise this scene where I can. Hope for more, but also I guess not too much more. Already I'm personally just seeing a hurdle with the concept alone. 
Following that, we have Sam at her very first job as a retail worker. Yeah, that really is the bad luck life for her. And then this proceeds to go on to yet another montage of all the bad luck going on. I mean, I guess that's what we crave, right? That is the children craving Final Destination again, just back-to-back -back scenes this time. Uh, I guess they're kind of trapped anyway. Now you've got the likes of glitter spilling everywhere, tapes rolling out everywhere, getting stuck on the shelf. There are cactuses all over her body. Hee hee hoo hoo ha ha. A little bit sadistic, I guess, but you know, comedy. And so of course she's put on cart patrol. Yeah! Technically, that's not the full bad luck experience. She wasn't fired on her first day, but hey, apparently Mr. Harmon's a very nice boss. So following that, we then come to Sam going immediately back to the orphanage. Forget the one month delay. She's now come to visit Hazel herself. Hazel is the little girl from the start of the movie. Yet another orphan who's yet to go through 10 years of this. Whereby Hazel is sad, wondering if she'll never find her forever family. And that's, that's that scene done. So following that, we then have Sam sitting on the road outside of a restaurant. Proper down in the dumps experience, you know? Whereby she meets a bad luck black cat. And I'll give another praise here. This is good animation. It may look like a mobile advert turned into a movie and I still stand by that, but there's lots of like eye communication between these two that's like clearly, you know, built by talented animators. And out of the kindness of her heart, because she's the protagonist, she goes to give the cat part of her panini. I have a feeling cats aren't meant to eat bread, but uh, don't worry about it. The small details are in how things can go wrong, not cat diets, apparently. Anyway, with this, she goes on to monologue to the cat, grumbling about how Hazel's orphanage visit was getting cancelled, exposing about all of her thoughts rather than really showing it on show, and then wishing she could just get a little bit of luck. You know, any kind of nuance from a normal Pixar script was a... Uh, Apparently lost in this rendition. And if good luck was something you could actually hold in your hand, I'd give it all to Hazel. God, why does she have to tell her entire life story? Why can't she just eat at a table like the rest of us? Anyway, finally she finds a lucky penny, and of course, repeats that damn saying again. Find a penny, pick it up. And all day long, you have, have good luck. This is some really dumbed down dialogue. I guess it's interesting to see a little bit of how the inner workings of Pixar work, because clearly it wasn't John Lasseter that polished up the scripts. Kind of feels like how your grandma would talk to you, you know? Always repeating the most basic of baby rhymes, and practically repeating them every conversation you have with them, you know? And so Sam wakes up the very next morning, whereby it's a montage of the opposite. Though not very montage but we'll allow it. Now the window slams shut in the morning. The socks! Oh, they match! Wonderful! She did the washing. The toaster works. More than anything, I guess that's kind of neutral luck, but we'll take what we can get. And we come to learn that the lucky penny is actually a four-leaf clover coin. Honestly, I actually quite like that. That's a nice, like, detail. Turns out it's gonna be a MacGuffin of an actual item, but still, I, I like the visuals of it, you know? Now, not only is the toast neutrally lucky, but on several tests of luck, the toast always lands exactly as wanted, as long as Sam holds on to this lucky coin. It is literally a lucky penny. And so after doing the bottle flip challenge a few times with the toast slice, she requests to visit Hazel again for a surprise. Honestly, I'm surprised the orphanage is still letting her visit because this lady is obsessed. But before we get there, of course, it's time for a secondary montage of good luck as well. I feel like there needs to be a scene in between these scenes to at least space things out, but uh, maybe that's me being critical. Wow, it's almost like that's my job. <laughs> but yes, now it's a montage of a great day at work, just the opposite of what we saw before. I'm kind of just repeating the same elements again, but sure. Now she can throw around boxes for maximum efficiency. She can be as reckless as she wants, but it all works out. It's all all just great. And then, despite having the very good luck charm on her that should make things work in her favor, she goes to the loo, loses the coin down the toilet, where it's barred behind an automatic sensor. I actually kind of like this bit where she's sneakily trying to grab it because the sensor is her villain, I guess, but she loses it anyway. My question is though, is this intentional? It might be because I'm too corrupted because of the amount of mobile ads I've witnessed, but is this sexual? There's a lot of butt to the camera in this scene, you know? And I feel like there's a weird vibe, even just the fact that it's a scene of her going to the toilet. I'm not gonna say it's intimate, but it's a little bit uncomfortable, maybe? Anyway, as if this is a Groundhog Day experience, the day just loops perfectly to the next scene once again. I guess we're just kind of cutting corners to the animation backgrounds, maybe. Whereby Sam is now rambling to the cat who's appeared again, only for them to turn around with... What? You flushed 
my panty down the toilet! Yes, the cat is a Scottish talking cat. Never trust an animal in an animated movie. They all can talk anyway. Going for that Disney princess vibe, I guess, where you've got your female protagonist and they've always got an animal companion. Just this one also talks as well. Surprise, surprise, it's now time for a chase sequence now that we've learned of the cat's secret. And again, this is a great display of some luck montaging. I'm still a bit bothered that they're all so combined close together, but we'll allow it. Sam is chasing after the cat and there's practically an entire marathon in the way of her with all the things going wrong for her and right for the cat. Her shoe gets stuck to some gum. The cat can climb onto umbrellas. She's stuck to a crane with a branch in her bag. The cat practically floats everywhere with all the luck in the world. Until finally, after all sorts of blips and blaps, Sam lands in the dumpster. <laughs> With the cat thinking that it's finally gotten away, it gives a report, creates this giant green portal, I guess, in the ground, jumps to a another dimension. Oh, this has gone off topic very quickly. And the girl jumps in with her. Ooh, decapitation. Now that is unlucky. Guess the kids really do crave Final Destination. So yeah, now suddenly there's a whole new dimension. Aliens? The girls manage to get away onto the ship, whereby we learn a little bit of a tip from the cat's origins. In Scotland, black cats are considered very lucky, thank you very much. And we come to learn that the coin was not gifted by the cat earlier, it was dropped. And then to fill out the lucky vibes even more, leprechauns make an appearance. Yes, it's gonna be one of those movies. I was once told that leprechauns are kind of a problematic figure, but but I don't know. Does this put a bad taste in people's mouths? Or is it a genuine good use of the luck theme? I genuinely don't know. But I do know that's kind of pushing it as well. Anyway, story beats ensue. We learn there is a penny depot. The cat learns that he's brought Sam with her and they agree to heist into the place by going in disguise since they're both in trouble after what's happened. And so team up together they do. Sam has a button on the side to suggest using it as a coin instead since the coin is missing down the toilet. And after Sam continues to ramble about her goals and aspirations in life, the cat turns around with... I'll borrow it for my friend. For your friend Hazel, yes, I've got that part. You said it like a hundred times. Wow, this cat knows how to critique writing as well. And so with a mutual benefit in tow, they work together. So what are their names again? Ah yes, the girl is of course Sam, but this new Scottish black cat, their name is Bob. Seriously? Literally just Bob? The most basic and unattachable name you could think of? Listen, I know there are people called Bob in the real world, but to me it just seems like such a non-name, you know? It's a placeholder if nothing else. Why is a cat named Bob, you know? Gone are the days of Mike Wazowski or Lightning McQueen, I guess. Bob. Okay, and so now they go on to sneak back into the borders. With all the different cats who went out in the world cashing in their coins, apparently now with all breeds of cats. Why is it every breed and not just black cats? Are all cats lucky or bad luck? I thought only black cats were associated with that. Anyway, we also come to see the captain who just kind of looks like an elf. Apparently they are a leprechaun, just these leprechauns are very elf-like. And in a very classic, boring, cliche way, Bob goes to try to distract the captain with all your classic kind of basic lines. Do you like jokes? They get through and off we continue. I'm just gonna warn you right now, we're gonna start seeing very little luck-based animation. You know, kind of the thing you wanna see the most. They combined what, like four montages all at the beginning and now we're in the luck realm. It's just kind of gonna be a normal cartoon heist of visuals. Something to grab onto. So they invade into the locker room of leprechauns, whereby Sam is gonna pretend to be a leprechaun despite being five times their height. All right. Deary me, you're a big lass. I... And also somehow it works. I guess there's comedy there, but this feels very basic in the comedy field, you know? Still, she pretends to be a leprechaun. She met a Latvian guy down at the Harry Lemon. Aye, she did. Cheers to Latvia for growing them big. And again, why are they being kind of sexual about it? I feel uncomfortable, man. And with that, they get to head on out and witness the world. It's the land of luck. Look at it out there. Now there are animal people, but the pigs are bipedal. I guess this is the ending of Animal Farm. With these big rotatory systems and an idyllic environmentally friendly world. Wow, brilliant. On the side as well, you've got the transport system that's just ripped out from the Blue Sky Studio Robots movie. 
And then of course there's Sam fumbling around in this world, hesitant to deal with all the, these tiny transport modes when she's so tall, and falling through it of course. It's a hint of bad luck, but it's, it's not quite the same, you know? To which the cat says, There is no one lucky here, you need to blend in. Stop trying, because nobody does. Ah, how, how does that make any sense? You have to be lucky, don't try, just be lucky. Alright, we'll keep going anyway. And from there we come to meet our next friend, another leprechaun by the name of Jerry, who isn't surprised by Sam's height until later for some reason, and also blesses us with this. Have you ever tried grilled cheese? Riveting dialogue. Anyway, Sam is offered an experience, but she's worried she might be too unlucky for it. It's all about an opportunity to grab a penny from the depot along the way by getting to press her own. It's yet another sequence of luck, but it doesn't hit the same way. What we've got now is a little bit of this. You've got some Irish violins going on in there, a whole lineup of leprechauns spinning around on this rotatory system of a room, grabbing pennies, pressing them in, and letting them be sucked up. All the while, Sam, of course, is trying to steal a button for herself, and naturally it all goes wrong. Slightly. It's not so much like a Final Destination's Rude Goldberg machine of mistakes, it's just like minor blips along the way that somehow cause mayhem in like the rhythm of it all, but it doesn't really hit the same. And then as a worst case scenario, the fake button of all things is the thing that gets incorporated near the end, and they're all gonna be spotted for it. Well, yeah, it's a, it's a sequence, you know? Losing steam very quickly now that we've hit the wall of this world, I guess. So following that, of course, Sam immediately reveals everything to Jerry. Jerry asks if they need any help and she just says, yeah, hey, I'm not a leprechaun if you couldn't tell from my 10 feet stature. There's no build up of trust or developing their relationship over time. It's just immediately, hey, first leprechaun I've met, I am a human and I have a bunch of emotional baggage we need to address and deal with. You want to help? And yeah, he does. He, he just does. We learn that there's the bad luck realm on the bottom of this whole world beneath the floor and some hazmat suits are called in. This is basically just Bunny Monsters Inc. Like a hodgepodge of old animation tropes, cliches, and Pixar building blocks. This movie doesn't stand out as its own unique project. It feels like a very standard and mid production. The world isn't that creative and inviting like the world of Monsters Inc. or Toy Story. In fact, the very fact that the cat immediately revealed itself by talking immediately loses any kind of influence that the Toy Story vibes had by always successfully hiding from humans. How interesting to see how far this movie can fall when you compare it to the super clean polish of an actual Pixar production. So there's a whole sequence where the leprechaun captain appears, immediately spots Bob and not the gigantic human, and then later on, Jerry learns that they used to hunt for lost coins left in the real world. There's apparently a clever little robot that collects it. So they had drones. They had drones for the real world, okay. But you need a good luck crystal to power it. This, this fantastical bunny drone. Don't know why batteries couldn't work, but I guess good luck energizes everything. This is, again, a Monsters Inc. thing. Screams are the only energy source used. They haven't invented electricity yet. And also as one other hurdle to this whole thing, apparently the control stick for this drone is somewhere else entirely as well. Just, you know, anything for a delay to split up a mission for a tiny project that's not that impactful, to be honest. And so the deal between Sam and the cat is back on. And so off they go. Once again, this is meant to be another sequence of, wow, look at that, this magical world. You've got the music in the background, sounding like it's something out of The Sims or something, but the fantasy of these visuals is not that magical looking. You've got some nice ideas plugged in, like the concept of right place, right time. You get to see where good luck is created and how ideas are put onto an idea leaf and then passed on to the next floor, but like, it's, it's not that investing. Wow, the idea leaves go to the pig foreman. Brilliant. But what is nice is also there's a dragon now. The CEO of good luck is a dragon. Again, I'm just kind of getting Monsters University vibes now, but sure, we'll go with it. She now has the ability to sniff out bad luck specs. And then she goes ahead to wink at Sam for some reason. It's not really addressed why she does this later. She doesn't recognize she was a human at all, just winking at a tall employee apparently. We then come to see a little bit more of how the good luck world works, whereby four of the leaves become a good luck crystal and they try to grab one. And like there's a sequence I guess of Sam not quite having the good luck enough to handle it, but the cat can swat it down to grab it, you know. And it's like, this story isn't very hooking, you know. The highlights so far have been when you see crazy good luck, and crazy bad luck. 
This kind of swatting at tiny mechanical things in the background that's not that fantastical just isn't very good. And more so than that, these good luck crystals don't just work alone, you need to get a randomizer to break out the idea within it. Yeah, whatever hurdles you can come up with. You're saying luck is random? Randomizer. Yeah, okay, that's a theme, I guess. And then you learn of other things. There are ancient luck stones. They're kind of like the batteries of this world. There are luck lines that spread out of here and into the real world, like power cords controlling the world. And then you get news of things like roots and goblins create bad luck down below, and that's actually vaguely interesting. I don't really care about the engineering mechanics of good luck crystals, leaves, specks, and stones, and lines. But goblins? Show me the goblins, please. And so Jerry was en route to his task. He split off to go and find this bunny drone, and it was... Right next to the entrance again? Gosh, this is not hidden at all. This isn't a good place to write it at all. And Sam goes on to a control room where she gets to see everyone tracking luck all over the world. That's one lucky grandma. And again, the dialogue is just so dumbed down for the audience, just constantly commentating on what's going on on screen in a way that's just condescending, I guess is the best way I can put it, really. But immediately, with all three pieces put into place, they go to control the bunny drone. And so the bunny drone goes out of the portal, out to the real world. None of the humans seem to question or spot it or do any kind of interacting with it. Meanwhile, Sam goes to spot that the camera is seen on the big screen and everything. Oh my god, they're about to be exposed. So what on earth could Sam possibly do to keep the distractions high, to not get in the way of all the other cat people? Well, of course it is. Remember the start of this movie? It's a sing and dance sequence. This, like, look at this. This is just bad, man. Like, it's so cringy and clearly plugged in as a retention beat. Is this a character trait from Sam? Is, is this a musical? I don't think it is. It's just a deus ex machina that just feels so soulless and clearly just a checklist along the way. Thankfully, I'm immune because uh, I'm a workaholic. Oh boy, thank you for making it halfway through this video. This is going to be a quick poke to tell you to subscribe or let us know of other terrible movies you'd like us to cover. It's rare that I get to do a Pixar terrible, but with this knockoff version, we've now completed the full trifecta. So tell us on our Discord server or in the YouTube comments what you'd like to see next. Anyway, I'll let you get back to the terrible luck movie, but also just wanted to say thank you for getting this far in. Now let's resume. Suddenly the drone has got the penny. No idea how or where. I assume it was in the pipelines of the sewers. We didn't see it go underground or anything. We didn't see it do anything. It was only the map view we got to see because they they didn't want to animate it, I guess. That could have been so interesting to see some camera motions around a drone. The fact it was just a GPS look the whole time is so cutting corners and uninteresting, man. So following that, the captain then makes a call to everybody, mentioning about the button trickery and how there's a penny thief within their mix. And the drone is back and covered in sewage, to which we get another delay in the form of the vacuums taking it all away. Also, I'm not just going to gloss over the fact they just outright have a big old sludge of brown mixture to make all the kids laugh at the fact that it's, you know, covered in poo. What a lowbrow form of comedy. Anyway, the plot continues with the idea that they can still get the coin at the in-between, learnt through a phone call. And like, again, there's so little interesting elements anymore. The directing is gone at this point. The phone calling is just boring shots of listening, you know? It's not even a good split screen. The luck really is the most interesting part of this movie's concept, and we see so little of it. And so, Sang goes to make it to the in-between. Uh, what button did you press? BL, basement level. Is that not the below? All right. And so they take the elevator down to BL1. But oh no, don't take us to BL1. BL1 stands for bad luck one. Whoa, not basement level one. It's it's like a basement, but not the basement. Wow. What is vaguely interesting is that the gravity shifts and goes in reverse in the below. But that's about it. Because like this whole elevator direction trick looks nice, but only really in live action because... Physics doesn't actually work that way. In animation, you can do whatever you want. It's a rare display I've seen where a shot actually looks better in live action than animation. And by copying the formula of what someone else has done, you've actually made a worse project in the field that is more creative. Incredible. Now suddenly Sam's bad luck locks in as she's left out of the elevator and it disappears without her, with the cat giving her notes on how to climb back up to the in-between. They reject the idea of just bringing back the elevator with another button press. No, no, just forget about it. 
or you could just jump down slash up the elevator shaft to make progress again. But hey, well, that's too logical, right? But okay, I will give them this. Now we get to see a second side of the world that could be interesting. Now suddenly, there are goat people. Brilliant! As well as a little bit of the roots and goblins along the way. And as a parallel to the bad luck experience in the good luck transport system world, now we get to see a bridge breaking and the ball falling the wrong way. The roller coaster is out and buckets hitting workers. All to swing us into the tube that leads to Tower 13. See, I vaguely like the idea that Sam could be lucky in the bad luck realm or something. Uh, but it, it, it's not really expanded here. It's just... The transport system goes wrong, but just about right for Sam. And it's, there's something here that could have been better, but it's not. And it's a shame, man. But now that Sam's made it to Tower 13, where she can find her way back to the in-between, we get to see a bunch of title doorways. Wow, look at all of them. Look at the creative prowess of some good bad luck related comedy. Smell it, but can't find it. It's a wet one. Ugh, gross. It's all poop jokes. All of them. It's just different versions of jokes about poop. This is John Lasseter's legacy, especially after being cancelled. And so Sam finds a shaft that she can follow, briefly getting stuck inside of the pipe, again with a shot that's showing a lot of, hmm, before she finally drops down to dodge some debris that's in the way, jumping through to this big space. For bad luck is just a mirror image of the good luck. Okay, you gonna do anything with that theme or? Honestly, I still thought she was going to be, like, the queen of the bad luck realm. We didn't even meet anyone in the bad luck segment there. We just sort of speed ran through all the hallways. But what we do get to meet is the one character in the in-between, Jeff. Jeff the Unicorn. He's the engineer behind the randomizer machine, showing off the bad luck machine that he built that then goes into the randomizer, and explaining that this machine was needed because bad luck attracts more bad luck, so bad luck specs often tend to clog up. It, you know, like, it's a whole... Do you care? I don't care. After that, we then get a whole bunch of exposition. I no longer go by Jeff. I have reverted to my birth name. Heimdall! Yeah, so what we come to learn from this backstory is that not only does he have an old name, but the CEO Dragon was their one true love. And that they had to clean out the clogs by hand back in the day when a pipe exploded. And the CEO was the one to help him out when he was bombarded with bad luck specs, I guess. And that it took four months to recover because of how much bad luck can linger. They turned bad luck into good luck. The CEO became fearful of bad luck. Then she broke his heart. And now they're both... Uh, alone. You know, that kind of would have been nice with some visuals, to be honest, not just a unicorn talking the whole time. Also, an interesting detail, um, they explain that they, he changed his name to Jeff halfway through, that he, his, no, his name is no longer Jeff, and he changed it to Heimdall, but um, the movie's going to continue calling him Jeff for the rest of the runtime, so like, why, for one, is there a change of name, and then why not respect the new name that was brought up? This is a 2022 movie, you know? So anyway, bringing out the plotline again, Bob makes a reappearance now, and they go to find the bunny drone that's in this in-between. Heimdall goes to pull it out, and we come to learn... Oh, I sent it up to the penny depot to put back into circulation. So really, it was all just one big waste of time. I get that the point is to witness the world, but also, we're kind of speed running the world at the same time. None of the deliveries going on is a satisfying form of progress. So now the conclusion is that Sam says we've got to go to the CEO Dragon. If the dragon helped a random engineer, she'll help a total leprechaun, of course. I can't give up on Hazel. Or you, Bob. Ah, isn't that nice? I don't believe her. In fact, she's been going solo for like the last 10 minutes. And so, here we are now with the dragon CEO. Immediately, she's able to get right to the reception area and request a viewing with the dragon. And we come to learn the dragon is actually allergic to bad luck specs. Before the CEO calls out bad luck as sadness and destruction manifest. Not really the best trait to have when you control the world that is 50% bad luck. Can you imagine dealing with bad luck every single day of your life? <sighs> I feel like my nose is dented with how heavy they are on the nose. What I think is also interesting on the second half of this scene is like, she goes on to ramble about how good luck is joy and hope manifest and yada yada, but it's in the direction for the cameras in this movie that's been very weird. In this scene specifically, it's directed as if like the characters are actors who are incredibly stellar performers. This is filmed like one big long take of a monologue of prowess, but it's just animation. Again, it's like they're mimicking character tricks from live action, but it doesn't translate as well into animation. These characters aren't moving with all of their cheekbones and their eyes. There's a little bit of eye acting earlier with the cat in the panini scene, but this is just 
standard animation with a camera that's overzealous on them. It's strange. Anyway, Sam, after explaining the whole thing, receives another coin so she'll be back to her normal self. And by that, I mean secretly lucky, but not really. And then they linger on again with another heavy-handed theme of how the last person the dragon helped needed four months for the bad luck to stop lingering. They were the best four months of my life. Yeah, we get it. And then we've come to our turning point. Our main protagonist finally has the thing they wanted. They finally got that coin of good luck so they can give it to Hazel and yada yada. But Bob is now in trouble. I still hate the fact his name is Bob, man. Bob is finally taken by the captain for interrogation, seeing as his paw prints are all over the button. Why exactly they didn't come to that conclusion earlier and instead interrogated several other leprechauns first, I have no idea, but you know, delays are delays. This movie's not really got a lot of content, let's be honest. So Sam jumps onto the car and returns the coin to Bob saying, here, here's the one you lost. Retroactively abandoning Hazel, leading for her to be the very next villain of Meet the Robinsons, I guess. And so with a whole new plan of action, and that uh, captain conflict immediately over, by the way, they're going to go and help Hazel in a different way with only one hour left. We're going to turn off bad luck. The plan is to stop the mixer that Heimdall has created, create a giant clog of bad luck so that none of the bad luck will go into the randomizer and there will be nothing negative in the real world. Also, Heimdall is just now randomly exercising. I guess so he's just written out of being a hurdle, I guess. What classical storytelling. And so they do. The machine turns off and we see good luck all over the globe map. Now, if Hazel's visit goes well, with only good luck going into the world, she can finally find her forever family. So then, my question is, so now the visit isn't cancelled for Hazel? Or, or is this an entirely new one? Are these parents flip-flopping based on the luck that's going out in the world? Like, what's going on here? Logically. Sam now is content with her time and heading back to the real world, hoping she can do something good with her luck, and hoping her bad luck won't get in the way anymore. But then... It's coming from the in-between. There must be something wrong. Well, yeah, there's just one worker down there anyway. Suddenly, by asking for too much of a good thing, everything, of course, goes wrong. The bad luck clogs up and then explodes into the randomizer. Now only bad luck is going into the real world. Hazel's visit is cancelled again. Her would-be parents certainly are a flip-flopping flannel of something floppy. It even goes so far as to say that the good luck stones themselves break. Clovers are shriveled up and the pigs can't create good luck ideas anymore. Now, all of the good luck pennies in the world have become contaminated. And even Bob's extra super secret penny that he has inside of his collar doesn't work either. But wait a minute, why does the cat have another hidden coin inside of his collar, you may ask? Well, it's because it was a secret. And in fact... I'm English, actually. Yes, I tactically didn't mention this, but you might have noticed yourself. The cat is Simon Pegg. Simon Pegg isn't Scottish. Meaning, if you have even a vague idea of who the main celebrity casting slot's heritage is, you can predict this kind of plotline a mile away. Oh my god, the English celebrity is English! Like, I kind of like the idea, but it's wasted on a poor casting choice, to be honest. Turns out the black cat isn't lucky, it's actually bad luck, and a coin is needed to get back to neutral. But also, this super secret coin was corrupted anyway, so it's kind of just like a waste of a reveal so that everyone gets upset with him. Ah, uh, I don't know, man. How, how do you mess this up? It's like meant to be a plot twist, but it has like no impact in any way. And so now only bad luck spreads. The luck lines, they fade away. The human world and luck world have been severed for good. There must be a way to reconnect, but without good luck, there is no way. Oh, but Sam has to go home. Oh my God. You're... A human? Yes. God, I could have never guessed. You never should have come here. You know, it's a whole thing. It's the end of the second act, so it's got to get sad, but it also just doesn't work. I don't know. So everyone decides, let's banish the both of them, but also they can't be banished. You've specifically severed the world between the luck world and the real world, you know? And so at the pit of all of this drama, finally now we have a heart to heart with Sam and Bob. Still hate that his name is Bob, but whatever. Not even Robert or Robbie. I didn't even expect Bobbert is fine to me. But anyway, what does follow now is a couple of lines that are genuinely all right. This is the point where the two characters are praising each other for pros that they have about each other's character, right? And there are some nice lines in there. Your first instinct is to share, like the tasty meat bread, and you'll endure the worst bad luck ever to make it happen. Your friend Hazel doesn't need good luck, because she has you. Though also, now that I've just listed them out, they're actually not that great. 
Like, it's it's okay. It's decent. But, you know, yeah. There's your heart to heart. There's your turnaround. Time for something to happen now. So what are they going to do to get themselves out of this situation? Where are they going to get some good luck? Well, by the logic that there's some good luck down in bad luck. I think this was established earlier. I don't remember. <laughs> are you paying as much attention as I am? Probably. Oh, so apparently this is something that Sam witnessed early on. While running down in the bad luck realms, there's a brief shot of them... I guess playing basketball or being around a green light, that's what we're bouncing off of. And so down to bad luck they go. And so we come to a furnace-like door. A new place we haven't seen before as apparently... I must have come in the back door last time. All right, and now, only now, ugh, do we actually get to see some of the roots and goblins from the bad luck realm? I said that we saw them earlier. I'm not actually sure if we did. Now we do. And it turns out it's one big bar. It's got that classic Pixar soundtrack feel. And what do you know, listen to one of the very first lines in this scene. Bob? Oh, is that you? Where the heck you been, brother? The bartender is that same old Pixar VA classic, John Ratzenberger. Although it's not just a cameo this time, this guy keeps on yapping for the final 15 minutes of this movie. As we come to learn that the cat was a regular at this bar back when they were in bad luck to the point he's even got his own bar stool and he's welcomed by them all so i guess sam does get to be queen of bad luck it's just kind of crammed in at the end now here oh, it's a whole thing what we come to learn is that occasionally some good luck is floated down here and collected into the lucky shot so that all of these goblins and roots who have dealt with bad luck their entire lives finally get to have a hint of joy in their lives there's a weird tone of segregation and like i guess almost species oppression that doesn't really get addressed they don't really want to touch on it, but there's something here. Makes you wonder why a goblin has never tried to, like, invade into good luck realm. Like, why not just get in the elevator, experience some good luck, and then go back down? It's a genuinely nice atmosphere down here that I kind of wish they could have expanded more, but instead we're just going to get it for, like, the next 15 minutes straight. That's pacing. And so they grab the jar of lucky speck dust, taking away from the lower class bad luck species the one piece of joy that they have. And though they say that the CEO won't be happy to see them for being the cause of all of this issue in the first place, they will be happy to see Heimdall. And so off he pops, showing up. Unicorn. Jeff. It has been a hundred years. This feels a little extra furry somehow. This unicorn just seems strangely sexually open. Is that in character design or have I just been on the internet too long? The CEO dragon then goes on to burn all of these specs to create a bunch of luck crystals. One bad luck and two good lucks. That's funny. The good luck one has a better reaction rate. That's cool. Oh, oh no, that was intentional? Oh, okay. So it turns out now the dragon intentionally created two good luck stones so that only those could be put in the machine and create a world of endless good luck only. You said it yourself, Sam. Without bad luck, your world could look just like ours. So the CEO is the villain now? But what she's saying kind of makes sense. But it turns out no, with Sam and her sense of high horsisms, decides to jump into the machine after the CEO with a full confrontation. You can't just have two good luck stones out in the world. That would be t too much of a good thing. You have to have some bad luck in the realm because there's good in the bad luck. But, but there, there literally isn't. There's camaraderie around bad luck. That's about it. Uh, is that is that the theme? Because I, I I didn't get that theme from the pub really down below. I think everyone would be a lot happier with a lot more good. Anyway, okay, sure. On goes the sequence within the machine with its big turning clock-like motions. Where Sam goes on to ramble that it's because of bad luck that she got to experience everything she got. She got to meet the people she met because of bad luck. And really, bad luck has its values as well. It's like a nice theme. I get that would be the message by the end. I'm just not convinced, I'll be honest. The movie's done a bad job explaining that. I blamed bad luck for everything that went wrong in my life. Yeah, and you'd be right. Was it not the mop's fault for trapping you in the bathroom? That one time, like, what, what? You're gonna tell me it taught you how to use a credit card successfully? The message at the end of this scene is don't fear bad luck because you have each other and that makes you the luckiest I know. So, you're lucky enough, don't take more good luck. Uh, I don't know, it's just, uh, And so with that, they go for both. Congratulations, guys. You're now also the cause of anything that goes wrong in the real world as well. 
Nice one, gang. And so off the machine goes. Again, isn't the clogger machine still down? I don't think they fixed the clogger machine, so that's not going to... All right. And suddenly it all bursts out everywhere. We see good luck spraying everywhere up top. I don't believe any of it. Now suddenly the rainbow lines come back on. And it, it, it only looks like good luck to me. Sam has a look on the monitors in the control room and sees, hey, hey the parents, they finally finished flip-flopping. They've come to visit Hazel. Oh, look, it's good luck again. Ruining the purpose and message of the movie wholeheartedly. How? How did the short do a better job than the movie? The short even gets to the point of there's a value in bad luck, but no. The CEO then goes on to visit the bad luck bar, somehow not being allergic to absolutely everything that goes on, bringing down yet another good luck crystal, only giving the working class a hint of joy since they don't get to be entitled to all the good luck as they have decreed. So, come on back. Does the captain even do anything in this plot? I, I don't think so. I think she just gave up halfway through the movie. And they're basically just like, thank you guys for sending all the bad luck our way once again. We wouldn't change a single thing. Let's crowd around this basketball hoop. It's the only source of joy. Other than, I assume, the alcoholic beverages sold at this bar. Bob is then asked to stay in good luck. They create Bob his very own lucky penny. And Bob finally gets the lucky life he's always wanted. Although he also already had it because he had the coin for a little bit of time for his ninth life. To which Bob rejects anyway. Uh, messaging. Bob will stay friends with everybody, but wants to spend the rest of their days with Sam in her world. They finally found their forever family. So, you're telling me that, uh... From an outsider's perspective, like from the perspective of the receptionist at the orphanage, the bad luck lady ends up getting a cat as the crazy, lonely cat lady archetype instead. Brilliant. Also, the CEO just isn't allergic to being down here. All right. <sighs> Jump ahead to one year later. Sam is still working at retail. The luck never really improved for her. Sam becomes the manager. Wow, what great luck you've been bestowed. But I do like this one gag of a, a civilian accidentally hearing the cat talking. Map says nine minutes, but we'll take the shortcut. We come to learn Hazel was in fact taken on by those parents. Bob is out here speaking to Hazel now. And also the entire adopted family, apparently. Toy Story logic be damned. And Hazel concludes that she's really lucky she found these guys. Because remember, there's only value in good luck. Even in the bad luck, you make good luck out of it. So it's good luck you're after. Right. And they cycle away. Hazel stays over at Sam's tiny, cramped, bad luck apartment. And we get a final note. In the end, you might say that bad luck led me to the luckiest thing in the world. Or was it good luck? That's exactly my point! That ruins the entire message! And that was the terrible Pixar's knockoff luck movie. Clearly, John Lasseter founded some of the greatest Pixar movies, making a lot of those classics. But what makes a movie a classic is clearly a well-oiled machine. The group effort. And whatever John Lasseter contributed might have been good story pieces, but it wasn't a good script. Because without everybody else involved, this just looks so murky, mid, and I might even say... Bad. Some people are bestowed bad luck, and some people wholeheartedly earn their lack of luck. Skydance Studios are said to be making four other projects going forwards. One this year called Spellbound, one next year called Puku, a Ray Gun movie, and an untitled Jack and the Beanstalk project. Whether any of them will have anything close to a rousing success story, we'll see. I don't have the highest of hopes, but they've all got John Lasseter attached, so maybe we shouldn't even financially support these movies anyway. And again, I didn't mention this, um, the whole hooking point of this movie is how we get to see these Rube Goldberg good luck and bad luck moments. There was like, what, five, six scenes out of all the rest of it? Man, the concept is so interesting and they just flubbed it. And so much of it comes down to the direction and John Lasseter himself just falling flat on his own concept. Wahoo. So on that note, I'm just going to end things off there. My name's been Daz. Thank you for making it to the very end. I'm really lucky that you did stick it through. And I will see you in a little bit.